my name is Ryan Lynn. I work with Florida Perg students and I just wanted to pop on for a minute to tell everyone how they can uh, make sure that they cast a ballot this fall. So the voter registration deadline has passed and now we are working with students to make a plan to vote. I'm going to drop a little link in the chat if you cannot see the chat. Um, we will send out <laughs> a link, um, but it's really important to make a plan and think about how you're actually gonna cast a ballot this fall. Right now, students make up the largest, most diverse generation in the country, the largest group of eligible voters. And it's not just the presidential race on the ballot this year. There's justices for our state Supreme Court, state reps, local electeds, ballot initiatives, and so much more that you can use your voice and be heard. And we really want students to take that a possibility and make sure that their voices are heard. So make a plan to vote. Um, I hope to see you all at the polls this fall and thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for the important reminder and thank you for taking the time to join with us. Thanks for um, having me. I want to thank you all for joining us this evening for tonight's leadership lecture. Um, we're really excited this evening to have John Pat and please correct me if I'm mispronouncing your last name. It's Pate, but it's okay. Pate, okay, sorry. <laughs> John Pate. Um, City Manager for Opalaka. Thank you so much for joining us and for sharing your leadership um, experience and journey with us. Welcome. No, thank you. I really appreciate the invite. It's my, it's my uh, esteemed pleasure to uh, be able to provide information for young leaders um, like myself, uh, being a millennial and being a city manager of a municipal organization. So uh, it's really my pleasure. And I'm here to answer any questions uh, that anybody may have. Um, I give a brief introduction of myself. So as you all know, my name is John Pate. <clears throat> Been in municipal government for about 15 years. Um, started in the federal government, in the military, then uh, uh, civilian uh, military jobs. Got into law enforcement um, some time ago. Came up the ranks in law enforcement, was a chief of police, a director of public safety. And then from there, I branched off and became a city manager in a city called University Park, Illinois. And then from there, I became the city manager of a city Opalaka, city manager and the director of public safety. So I took a little bit of an odd course. If anybody knows anything about public office or public government, most city managers usually come from the finance or economic development ranks, right? So that's typically the path to city management. Um, now, uh, in the 21st century and in, in about the last three or four years, there's been a huge branch off where now you have a lot of city managers that were chiefs of police because of the current climate we have uh, in the United States and city managers needing to know the current climate and, and dealing with law enforcement, public safety and dealing with other issues as far as law and order. So <clears throat> I came from a, un, a, not a typical path, but a path is more common now I would tell you, uh, I enjoy city management very much. Um, it's very rewarding. Um, it's a lot of responsibility being the chief administrative officer of a city. Uh, if anybody's aware of Opalaka, Opalaka's form of government is a manager council form of government. So the city manager is the chief administrative officer of the city, not the elected officials nor the mayor. So I make all day to day decisions. Uh, of the city as provided through charter based on the authority of the uh, mayor, vice mayor and commission. Um, so I'm hired through appointment. So basically through a, a majority vote of the commission uh, to be, be the chief executive officer of the city. And it's more like a board of directors of, a, of a, a, a company, right? The board of directors hire the CEO and the CEO runs the company. So that's basically the form of government that Opalaka is. Um, a lot of responsibility, a um, lot of stress. Uh, it's, it's a position that's very, very interesting in that you get various topics that you deal with on a daily basis. Plus you have to know government, right? Because you, uh, you're dealing with economic, economic development, IT, human resources, parks and recreation, and so on and so on. And all those departments fall into my office, the clerk's office, um, I see, I said IT, economic development, community development, uh, the police department. If we had a fire department, it'd be a fire department. My last city I worked with had a police and fire department that fell under me. So there's a lot of responsibility. And, and like I said, it's always my pleasure to provide any insight or any opinions 
uh, in regards to the matter because being a millennial, you know, it's very rare for us to be in positions uh, of this type. And uh, the path I took uh, was a very hard one, but very easy one. So I'll take any questions if anybody has any. I know there are some questions that your instructor sent. I don't have my email up at this time. I'm gonna try to pull it up. Unless um, she could, can you post it in the comment section possibly? Sure, yeah, definitely. I'll, I'll post those as well. Um, I think one question that's obviously circulated a lot this semester is the new challenges that COVID-19 has, has brought and how um, the city has, has responded. So I would tell you COVID-19 has hit us hard uh, as far as the way we do work. Um, you know, our, our municipality, we were never prepared for telework, really never prepared, right? And COVID-19 happened and we were rapidly scrambling, uh, subscribing to Zoom. I think if you, uh, I think if you had any stock in Zoom or GoToMeeting or any of those uh, type of applications, you won big this year because I tell you those applications became very, very much popular and very much necessary to run government. Uh, so how my government kind of runs when COVID-19 first happened, uh, we closed our city hall and closed our public building. Uh, key staff uh, worked from home. Uh, other staff were allowed for a month to work with, uh, with pay for a month until we got a grasp of COVID-19 and scheduling. And then after that, we started working on staggered schedules and having staff come in uh, various days a week. So we didn't have a lot of staff in the building in order to prevent the spread. And right now we still do a lot of teleworking where staff come in every other day and work from home every other day. Uh, Miami-Dade County and their funding has authorized remote workstations from key department heads. So uh, key department heads have workstations at home uh, on behalf of the CARES money that Miami-Dade County has provided the cities. Uh, so we're getting a lot of support from Miami-Dade County and a lot of support, um, you know, uh, in, in a lot of different places. So it's very, very, very much appreciated. So that's how we're kind of dealing with COVID-19. So a question, you're the seventh city manager in eight years. How are you connecting with the community to build that trust and morale? Well, let me tell you, it's very difficult. Um, it's very difficult to do that. Um, it's been a challenge especially being the seventh city manager. And uh, if anybody's been watching the news lately, um, there's been a lot going on with Opelika as far as uh, ridding the city of corruption and people that uh, are unsavory and have not been doing the proper thing on behalf of the residents. So um, Opelika is, is a complicated place to work, but it's, it's a town that has a lot of potential. The residents have been doing disservice for a very, very long time. And I see myself as an ambassador of the city. So I have an open door policy and I do a residence on an everyday basis. And I uh, actually uh, have interactions on a monthly basis with our residents on our uh, uh, Facebook page. So um, those that are techn te te technologically inclined and then those that are not, we try to have meetings in person, but with COVID that kind of has limited the public town hall meetings that we have. So we're trying to get our uh, residents up and running on Zoom uh, Zoom webinar and being able to watch our meetings and participate and do public comments. So uh, it's been very challenging, but very rewarding for me as well. The students in my seminar class would relate because they have to watch a Zoom public meeting. So <laughs> they're definitely, some of them may pop up in your, your council meetings, you know, to, to definitely observe there. Um, I'm going to post one of the questions that also came, um, and I know Christina just posted, how do you feel about the city and connecting via social media, um, since, you know, that's kind of a new um, territory as well. So, you know, it's very difficult in Opelika, because Opelika is an older community. Um, Opelika is an older community, and um, a lot of our residents are not... Uh, technically inclined. So we, it's very difficult to, um, how can I say, um, connect. So what we do is we do a lot of outreach through our uh, parks and recreation department where they reach out to our senior citizens, our senior buildings and our seniors that live in town and um, try to do outreach in that way. We provide masks, we provide PPE equipment to our seniors. And we, we actually do uh, weekly visitations um, um, 
where we uh, can um, visit with everybody. Let's see another question. I think we're saying you swear you wear many hats, um, uh, you know, and just looking at all the different departments and how do you juggle the the different responsibilities um, and delegate? So you know, now I, I have a cabinet of people that work for me. I have uh, nine department heads, so I have nine uh, departments that report directly to me, and I have department heads um, that uh, report to me on a daily basis based on the running the department. So I'm not really a lot into the weeds as far as micromanaging because I trust that my department has to run the departments in an equal and fair manner. Um, so in saying that, I do uh, have weekly staff meetings where I interact with my staff, but I let my staff do their work. I let my staff do their work and I allow them to run their departments and I'm here to assist them um, as best as possibly can as far as providing direction. Uh, direction goes two ways. Uh, my staff tells me what they need or what they desire. Um, and, um, and then what happens is uh, I get directives from the city commission. And then the city commission actually um, provides directives to the city manager's office based on initiatives, based on policies and legislation that they pass. So the information kind of goes both ways. Um, some of the information, like I said, is legislative and policy direction from that commission. And then a lot of it is direction and policy from my office. So it can be very interesting sometimes because you get into a lot of political, um, political agendas that come up a lot, right? Something that um, a politician or somebody in politics really wants to see for the good order of politics and not necessarily the good order of the running of a municipal organization. And I'm kind of that buffer that advises the city commission as well as my staff for kind of how to make everything work together and bring it together in jail. Let's see, uh, I've seen sometimes where change is presented with resistance, especially change that is aimed to reducing and limiting corruption. How are you handling this? It's a challenge every day, I will tell you. Um, I, I, I good Fighting the good fight. <laughs> fighting the good fight. And let me tell you, if you guys Google my name, uh, now in Florida, you will see a lot of articles in regards to a lot of corruption, a lot of things my office has uncovered in Opelika. As a recent, we found a code enforcement scandal where code enforcement officers were racing liens off homes and purchasing them uh, for their own uh, gain and it, a lot of stuff. And I tell you, I get a lot of political pressure. Um, I get hit uh, by the public. I get hit by the, the, the dais, uh, the elected people on the dais, and I uh, get a lot of criticism all the time, but I continue to fight the good fight and continue to remain positive and continue to run the city based on charter. And saying that, the only way I can be removed is three votes. So basically they would have to call a special meeting. They would have to have a reason to remove me and I have to be removed from a majority vote. And this climate day and age, it's very difficult to do that, especially if you're doing the right thing. Because residents kind of demand change. Opelika has been in financial emergency for quite some time. Uh, I don't know if anybody, everybody's aware of that. Um, we finally submitted our five-year recovery plan to the state that was approved uh, last month. Uh, we submit, sorry, we have been submitting our budgets on time since I've been the city manager and moving in a positive direction financially. Um, and there's a lot of oversight by the state, by the Chief Inspector General's Office and the Financial Emergency Board. So there's a lot of levels of oversight that we have in Opelika a lot of avenues that I have as far as resources and uh, being able to get assistance, technical assistance, especially from the state and the county. I'm gonna post a question from one of the students posted. Um, what advice would you give particularly to an MPA student or somebody who wants to go into management, um, you know, as far as to prepare for a career in, in city management? So the best advice I will tell you is get internships in government get internships in municipal government. Um, everybody that I know that works in economic development and some of our specialty departments are MPA students that were interns at once and end up becoming permanent employees of the city. Maybe as an economic development specialist, maybe as a planner um, and various different things like that. I would tell you, if you have an interest in municipal government, try to get those certifications, such as a planner, um, uh, 
purchasing, try to get a certification in purchasing. Uh, so you can work in, in, in the purchasing department, uh, look at becoming a CPA and looking and doing municipal government work uh, as a CPA. So there's those uh, main certifications that you have out there that are keen and needed in municipal government that government agencies look at, especially parks and recreation. Believe it or not, there is a certification in parks and recreation that you can hold to manage and, and work in the parks and recreation department. And I didn't even know that until we started recruiting from a parks and recreation director. So that's a lot that I know. So there are a lot of specialties out there to get you in municipal government and get you in the door. I mentioned kind of business administration. Uh, do you find that having some business um, experience mixed in with public sector? Um, you mentioned procurement, obviously contracting, purchasing is, is one um, area where that would be, be helpful as well. You know, I would tell you this. I think it's very important to be, have a diversified portfolio. I, my, my master's degree is in criminal and social justice, but I also have a degree, I have my MBA as well. Uh, but I got my MBA once I got started getting interested in city management, I went back to school and got a second master's degree. Um, so that's kind of my path. Um, I say diversify your portfolio as best as you can. Having an MPA, having an MBA is great, um, you know, or even have a certificate in business is fine. Having a certificate in accounting is, 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 is a really good option. Um, so there's a lot of certificate programs you get into. I, I would not necessarily tell you to get a second degree, a second master's, but get into certificate programs in those, those areas, I think would be keen and, 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 and very wise to do. One question that came up is with so many um, competing demands, how do you prioritize um, not only the demands of all the different departments, but of the different uh, stakeholders from the residents to the business owners to even your own council, city council? So yearly, so what we do is based on charter, we are mandated to do a strategic plan every year. So that strategic plan is developed based actually based on the input of all the stakeholders the business owners, people that come to and through the city, the residents, the council or uh, commission themselves, the departments and their priorities. And we develop a strategic plan for the year. And that gives me the direction I where to take the city that year. And so that strategic plan is voted on and adopted by the city commission. And that's, the, that's basically my roadmap for the year. So that's really how that develops. Um, you guys can go on our website and look under our charter, under our codes and look up strategic planning and you'll see uh, where we're mandated to do a strategic plan on a yearly basis and what it has to consist of. And one thing that uh, the students in one of my classes are going to be doing is doing a policy brief to a, a manager. So if you were to want students to, um, what would you want them to know about some of the most pressing issues, um, you know, that for them to focus on and to perhaps become familiar with, but the next um, most pressing issues, at least that you see in your work. So I will tell you an interesting issue that came about um, in our small town um, and it's adult establishments, adult establishments. As everybody knows, Florida is really known for their adult establishments. And my town is a town that kind of wants, wants to do away with them or restrict them. So we're working on policy in order to not prevent um, adult establishments to come in the city, but make more stringent regulations to make it difficult or a little bit more uncomfortable uh, for them to come into the city. So looking at areas such as that, um, looking at areas such as, um, uh, uh, let's see, um, another good area is looking at CRAs, uh, community uh, redevelopment uh, areas and developing them within a the municipal organization, even though the state is going away with them in the next 10 years, 10 or 15 years, but uh, doing that, uh, economic development policies and initiatives, uh, looking at um, amnesty programs to reduce debt in the community, um, amnesty in regards to liens on homes, amnesty in regards to code enforcement and civil violations that the cities have provided people. Um, providing them a way out, and that's a good revenue generator for the city. Um, and then looking at uh, initiatives, both on the state and federal level, as far as grants and legislative requests 
uh, of the state of Florida and um, your Lion States representatives, looking at those requests on a yearly basis and, and actually having a lobbyist to lobby on the behalf of your city, both at the state and federal legislature to get those monies. I think those are really, really good projects and priorities to kind of work on. I'm glad that you mentioned, because in the beginning you mentioned the CARES Act and how the money, you know, coming from the county and how, um, with what, how many, 34 municipalities in Miami-Dade County, how you guys are all, you know, buying for a slice of the pie. Um, Very challenging. The federal, the state, the county, um, and I guess just the relationships that you have um, at each level and knowing where to, to go to look for the money. <laughs> right. Very, you know, very, I'll tell you one thing. Um, it, the CARES Act has not been really challenging for the municipalities. You know, I belong uh, uh, to the city manager's organization. So we meet every Tuesday and we all kind of join together as a pack of 34 people as one voice when we're kind of expressing our opinions and our thoughts to Miami-Dade County. So the battle really hasn't been bad as far as getting financial assistance. We've been working on different formulas, population versus poverty rate versus uh, various other uh, formulas to get CARES Act money from the county. Um, they separated a pot of money for reimbursables or overtime for law enforcement, other uh, COVID-19 related issues. And they separate another pot of money for social service programs and rental reimbursement and various different things that the cities are vying for right now. Um, so the communication has been really, really good with the county. Uh, at first, the county didn't want to give us anything, and it was a huge battle with the cities in the county. Um, the county at first took the position, hey, we opened all these testing sites in Miami-Dade. We did all these resources. We do senior meals. We're not giving any municipality money uh, at all. And that's actually, if you go in the news stories, that's how it started. And then the pack of 34, I call us, came together and voices of all our mayors and all our city councils, all our commissions, and went to the county and said, no, you can't do that. Then they started developing these formulas and cities are starting to actually get multi-million dollar reimbursements now for expenditures they have taken uh, during COVID-19, such as PPE, uh, staff time loss, law enforcement services, and various different things like that. So very good example, uh, Professor. That's a, actually a good example. No, that, that's really interesting to hear how that plays out. Um, and since you mentioned about trying to uh, create a certain business climate and, um, you know, attracting some business and maybe making it a little bit harder for others, um, how do you create a, um, how do you build that vision for what you would like the, the community and getting the business community on board? So, you know, the biggest thing is being good uh, citizens uh, to the business community, showing support and being there for the business community. Um, Believe it or not, the business community is a huge slice of the pie in regards to our tax revenues or uh, avalim uh, monies that come in. Um, so, you know, I try to treat our uh, business owners as if they're residents, uh, but on a more, more higher level in that we want their cooperation and support. So during COVID-19, we've had businesses that catered for us, for our police department, provided PPE for our staff, and, and donated their services and various different things like that. So our business community really stepped up during COVID-19 because they truly care about the municipal government and operates because they can't operate without us, right? They need our inspections, they need our business licenses, they need our water and sewer services. So they need us and we need them. So, I mean, our relationship with our businesses have been phenomenal, phenomenal. That's good. Well, looking at some other questions, um, one thing you mentioned earlier was how a lot of people get their start in government through internships. What advice would you have to students um, that are seeking out internship opportunities and, and how to approach municipalities? So I would say if you don't see any internship opportunities for municipalities, I would email the city manager's office and email human resources of that municipality that you're interested in. We love interns. We may not always post for them but we always need them and want them. So if there's a municipal or government that you're interested in doing an internship with, reach out to that city manager, reach out to that assistant city manager, reach out to the HR department, or whatever department you're interested in doing your internship in. Reach out to those individuals and let them know that you have a true interest in doing an internship and they will respond back. Because I know I do. Uh, when I get intern support or people that want to be interns, I jump on it 
And uh, I have uh, quite a few that are under my wing now. And, you know, I, I take more, you know. Um, and even if it's not coming in the office every day or every other day, even if it's just you need advice about government and a path to go or a letter of recommendation or something that you need in, in order to get your foot in the door, I'm here to be supportive. Um, I, mean, I don't know if anybody knows, I'm 36 years old. So we really appreciate that. And I think that's really important because it goes into the value of mentors. And if you could talk about maybe any mentors um, that have been influential in helping you in your career. So I have been mentored by a lot of city managers. I've been mentored by a lot of police chiefs and about a lot of municipal organization leaders. Um, and that has been very worthwhile for me. I will tell you how I got started in city management. So when I got into law enforcement, um, I worked um, in public corruption. So I did public corruption investigations for five years for the Cook County Sheriff's Office. So I actually actually arrested and, 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 and investigated elected officials and public servants. So I did that for about five years. And that attracted me to my first job in the uh, Village University Park. They had issues with tax incremental finance and fraud. So I became the chief of police there, then the city manager. Um, I organized the city's first forensic audit that was done on all the funds, um, involved the FBI in regards to various investigations that uh, still haven't come to fruition, but they're working on. Then comes Opalaka, another municipality that has issues as far as money management. And so I, have the, I had the background and experience in kind of dealing with municipalities that had financial trouble as well as municipal organizations that had issues with corruption within the ranks and kind of rooting out that corruption and making sure that a municipal government is managed the way it should be. So I came in like a atypical manner, but it's trained me to go anywhere. I tell you, mm -hmm. the experience that I have, I can go to places like Opalaka, I can go to places like Coral Gables, I can go from the worst to the best, to the mid-size, to the middle issues, I kind of can deal with all of it because I have experience in kind of dealing with the worst. And if you can have experience dealing with the worst, going to the best is not that bad uh, for anybody, I would tell you. So um, really that's how I kind of got my foot in the door and kind of had things going for me in my career. I see, I see a question, where do I see Opelaka in 10 years? Opelaka, I see it flourishing. It's a town of a lot of potential. If you look at Opelaka and you look at Miami-Dade County, and look at economic development. There's a lot of economic development um, in Miami-Dade. And actually Miami-Dade is about landlocked right now um, when it comes to economic development. And if you look at the spaces where economic development can happen, you look at the areas of Florida City and Opalaka, a lot of undeveloped area. So I see the city booming in the next 10 years because there's no nowhere to build at anymore. There's not that much land to build at in Miami-Dade County. Um, so, you know, that is what, you know, that is what we're looking at. And unfortunately, we're the last to get the economic development, but I think the best is last. So I think uh, we're looking forward to a huge boom in the next 10 years. And I noticed from your background, you're what, celebrating 94 years this year or? Uh, uh, yes, this year, 94 okay. years. So six years, you know, big celebration coming up, you know, for yes, your 100 is. year. <laughs> yes, it is. Yes, it is. So Salome also asked if you were convincing someone, either a resident or a business owner, to move to Opelika, what would be your pitch? How would you convince them? I would say buy land cheap, move now, <laughs> and, 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 and build build from the ground up. That's what I would tell you, Opelika. Opelika has a lot of cheap land going for very little. And if you want to move to Opelika and you want to have this amazing house that you see on Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous, do it in Opelika. That's the way to go because the land is cheap. And like I said, you can build from the ground up and you get in the market while it's needed. You know, um, the city has a lot of incentives in place as far as new home homeowners and various different things like that. So I would tell people, look at the government, look how it's improving. Look at the track record of the last two or three years. The government has been moving in an outstanding direction and during that time. And I say, look at that and, and, and kind of look at where you, where you want your family at and kind of look at look from there. Um, as far as law enforcement is concerned, uh, Opelika has had a very high crime rate. That crime rate has lowered over the last year. So we're doing a lot of good things in a positive way for our community and for people that want to come to Opelika. Great. 
great. And kind of along those lines, um, you know, as those, you know, recruiting residents and interns and even employees, um, what would be their your advice to those that, you know, maybe are seeking out employment opportunities and um, how, what would be your advice for those, you know, especially that don't have public sector experience? You know, we had mentioned the internships. Do you, you know, reaching out to the city managers. Um, what other advice might you have as far as for developing their leadership skills? Yeah, so what I would, what I would say is this. Be persistent. Be aggressive, but not overly aggressive. And be focused and know what you want. And sometimes selling your leadership skills or your project management skills will get you in the door. A lot of municipalities are willing to train you about how municipal government works. A municipality, municipality can't train you how to be a leader. They cannot train you how to be a project manager. And they can't train you about typical life skills that an individual would have in the business sector. I can train you to be economic developer. I can train you how to be an HR specialist. I can train you how to do IT, you know, because those are courses that I can send you to. I can train you to do purchasing. I can train you to do budgeting. Just have an accountant background. I have a background in accounting. So there are a lot of opportunities for people that don't have municipal government experience, but just have basic life experience. So remember that and kind of um, strengthen those experiences. I know um, me, myself, personally, um, I always pushed myself to get leadership skills and very leadership uh, uh, courses. I went through Northwestern School of Police Staff and Command. I went through uh, Northwestern University's Executive Management Program. Um, about to go to Harvard University's public uh, public uh, policy program for government leaders. So there are a lot of uh, courses out there for you to take, and you don't necessarily have to be in government. You know, you can take these courses and get in these programs to get be proactive about your career and what you want to do. That's a good uh, point. Just taking advantage of any and all you know leadership opportunities that they can in order to build build up that skill set. Uh, when you're hiring, what characteristics really um, jump out to you to make you want to hire someone? Somebody that's organized, somebody that's a, a project oriented, somebody that is, uh, has a high level of integrity, uh, somebody that is eager to learn, and somebody that's motivated. Um, we need people that are motivated to do their jobs. Somebody that doesn't believe in an eight-hour day. I'd never work an eight-hour. I have not worked an eight hour day since I've been a city manager. Uh, my days range from eight to 12 to 13 to 14 hours. Uh, so I uh, work a lot of hours. So we need people that are go-getters, that are aggressive, uh, that want to be out there, uh, that want to be in the front lines, that want to support and be there for their uh, government and, and for their community. And we encourage residents, but we also hire non-residents. So we're open to anybody in, that has a skill set to want to be in leadership and lead. That's a big part of it is just the public service motivation, you know, wanting to really want to go above and beyond, you know, to help others. Um, a consistent theme that has come up in our leadership lecture is that it isn't a typical nine to five, the hours are long, the days are long. Um, how do you ensure your work-life balance um, and being able to maintain some kind of sense of, um, even the work bike balance is, is a bit of an oxymoron, but uh, being able to find a balance in your own life. <laughs> it, it, it's difficult. It's difficult. Every other week I have 14, 15 hour days because I have commission meetings. So our commission meetings, most commission meetings are not at any evening time. And of course I work a nine to five and my commission meetings are at seven o'clock at night and they last two to three hours. So uh, every other Wednesday, I have very long days. I have uh, committee meetings, planning and community development committee, uh, the personnel committee, the um, historic preservation committee. So I have a lot of committees and commissions that I'm responsible for. That I have to be at those meetings as a subject matter expert or, or the, uh, the city's voice as far as opinion to that, that committee. 
So it's very difficult. I typically lock out my weekends to try to meditate and take time for myself. Uh, and anytime I have free during the week, I kind of enjoy that time as best I possibly can. But even tonight, look, I'm with you guys. So, I, you know, that, that's, a, that's a wonderful thing. It's something that I really enjoy doing. Um, you got to be about public service and you got to know it takes long, long hours and a lot of sacrifice to work in government. And your significant other has to be very understanding of that and know that. So I think that's very important. No, I think that's, that's a great point. We have a question from Sylvia. Um, what is the city doing about bringing affordable housing built before 1990 up to hurricane code? Well, that's a very difficult. It's very difficult. Um, a lot of our houses are pre-1990. Of course, our new construction, we're making sure that that is in a place that's positive uh, moving forward based on uh, hurricane standards. But it's very difficult for older properties to bring them to standard just because they're grandfathered in. So we, anytime there's anytime there's new improvements to the property or new permits pull for restructuring, maybe a new roof or whatever, at that time we make them get to current code and standard. But as far as homes that are pre-1990 that are not to standard, we have no enforcement authority unless they're doing something new to improve their land. I guess another question, um, because Opelika has such unique architecture, um, how to, you know, encouraging new developments, but also maintaining the very, you know, characteristic, um, you know, look of, of Opelika? So that's an interesting question. So our city code actually has a color code and specific construction that's required for Opelika because of the historic uh, uh, symbol of the city. So any new construction that's being built actually has to be built based on architectural standards uh, based on the city's history. So there's a specific color code, there's, only, there's specific colors that your home can be. Um, uh, in Opelika, uh, you gotta go off a, a specific color palette, you have to go off a specific design, uh, our basic architecture. So there are a lot of standards in our code that's required in order to build an Opelika and maintain a house or business in Opelika based on its historic nature. Yeah, and I think a lot of um, us aren't even aware sometimes how these codes and these regulations kind of go about. Does your city have um, boards that residents can participate to be able to provide input um, on different um, city business? Yes, we do have uh, planning and community development. Uh, we have a human resources board, a personnel board. Uh, we have a um, civil service board. Uh, we even have a senior citizens committee uh, to deal with our senior residents. So we have a lot of boards and committees that are existent um, to help direct the city. Some boards and um, commissions are advisory, meaning they advise the city manager's office and they advise the government or the commission. And then some uh, boards are binding, meaning the decisions that I make, they're binding to the city, binding to my office and binding to the city commission. One board that's uh, in particular is planning and zoning. So planning and zoning, the, that's one of those boards that, are, that is uh, legislatively needed. And it's one of the boards that their decisions are actually binding and has to go up before the city commission for ratification. So as an example of a board somebody can participate in and there's actual um, progress and things to be involved in, um, in regards to that. So I first, one of our students was interested in learning how to perhaps get involved in one of those boards. How would you um, perhaps maybe advise them to proceed? Reach out to the cl uh, clerk's office of any city that, that you're interested in. Um, there are a lot of boards that do not require residency. It, um, some of our boards require uh, individuals that have a business background or even a non open locker resident. Um, so I will reach out to our clerk's office. I'll reach out to any municipality's clerk's office that you're interested in providing public service to, uh, especially board work. Okay, thank you for sharing that information. Uh, Tamika uh, posted a question in the chat. Has Opelika ever considered using the sister city partnerships as a form of development? I want to say Opelika has a sister city. I just don't know it on top of my head. Um, I think it's somewhere in Ghana, Africa. I think we do have a sister city. Um, that's outside the country, uh, just not on top of my head right now, um, currently. So I don't have that currently on top of my mind, but I know we do have a sister city. Okay, great. 
Do we have additional questions? Um, or I guess as we kind of start to wrap up, um, what is your biggest leadership um, value or, you know, um, skill that you think is most important to you serving in a leadership role? I think the biggest skill that's been that's most important to me um, is uh, honestly um, integrity. Good. I think that's the biggest one um, that I can kind of share with everyone. I think having level of integrity and honesty, I think is very good in the public service because it's lacking in a lot of places. Um, and being conscientious and, 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 and serving in the best way you can. Um, the true definition of a citizen or citizenship and knowing really what that is and being a contributor to your community, I think is very, very much important and very much needed now in this day and age. No, we appreciate that. It's so important and, you know, not for any of us to underestimate, you know, the contribution that we could have and that, you know, in order for our leaders to, to lead us, you know, we need to be able to support them and to give them feedback and guidance. Um, any other additional questions from our students in the audience? I really appreciate all the questions that have been submitted so far. Thanks again. Tamika says, keep up the good fight. Yes, yes. It's a good fight. And like I said, keep, please keep up with me. Email me. Uh, hit me up on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. If you have questions, please feel free to email me. If you need advice, guidance, mentorship, just a burning question about government, please feel free to use me as a resource. I will respond to your emails and I will interact with you because I believe Good government is important in order to have good government, it's good to have our students of tomorrow and today involved in government operations. We really appreciate that. Thank you so much. And you know, we appreciate your support of the department. Um, and the same thing, if there's anything that we can do to support you and the work that you're doing, um, please um, don't hesitate to reach out to us. We'd love to send you some interns. Um, do you, would you mind sharing your email in the chat for those that would be interested? Sure. And in the meantime, just be sure to visit the city websites um, to familiarize yourself with um, what's going on in the government. Like I said, especially this time of year, there's a lot going on, budget decisions, things that are gonna impact municipalities for the rest of the year. Mm -hmm. Um, so definitely reaching out. Like I said, there's opportunities to get involved and to learn firsthand. Um, and again, thank you for sharing um, your time and your expertise with us. Again, we know you're, you're very busy, but we really appreciate you taking the time to spend with us this evening. Okay. And at all, follow me on LinkedIn. Okay. Follow me on LinkedIn. There's a lot of, there's a lot of movement. I'm in a lot of movement right now. Um, I'm actually a finalist to be the chief of police in Milwaukee. So that's, that's big. Awesome. That's a big opportunity. As everybody's aware, Milwaukee has a lot of uh, issues uh, as far as uh, George Floyd and, and the law enforcement climate in Milwaukee. So please, if I'm not in Opelika, please keep up with me on LinkedIn um, and reach out to me. And like I said, whatever uh, you know, uh, I can do to be a resource, uh, please keep up with me. And also, like I said, follow me on LinkedIn. Please follow me on LinkedIn. I will be more than happy to be a resource for everybody. Fantastic. I'll definitely, I'll post your LinkedIn post in the chat as well. And uh, even though it would be a loss to South Florida, we do wish you all the best as a finalist um, for the position in Milwaukee. And I know you'll make a fantastic contribution anywhere you go. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. If everyone will join me in giving um, the manager a round of virtual applause. All right, thank you. Thank you once again. We really appreciate your time and expertise and definitely we'll be in touch and definitely we'll be following you on LinkedIn. Um, again, find him and we'll definitely be following and look forward to keeping in touch. Thank you. Thanks again. Bye-bye. Have a good one. Thank you.